Hi, Cynthia. How are you? Hi, Dr. Wynn. How are you? Good. Are you working? Uh, not right now. I, I, I just came back from work. <laughs> oh, okay. I, let me change my name. That's okay. I know who you who you sign in under, so I can see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you have a break? Huh? Did you have a good break? Did you have a short break? Oh yeah, it was good. I had to work though on on Fourth of July. Oh, mm -hmm. they made you work on Fourth of July? Yeah, because of that parade. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, it was hot down here. Yeah. I was able to get away for a few days. I'm finally coming back and adjusting to work again. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It's yeah, I went fun. I went up north for a few days and it's really the weather is really nice up there. Oh really? Yeah. In yeah. the northwest, like Portland and uh Washington, it's about sixty degrees to the highest is about mid 70 they had a heat wave coming through but <clears throat> it's generally cool now so <laughs> yeah port downtown portland um is still is still um reopening they had some protests and things were shut down a while back but <clears throat> oh, yeah. i remember that that protest yeah and so it was burning right over there too yeah, and they, well, you know, they had um, they had a protest. They had several protests, and then they had the Black Lives Matter. Yeah, um, and so, but the prior protests, like there was a lot of looting, so they, a lot of the the stores and the places were closed. So yeah, I think a lot of a few businesses stay closed permanently, and then you got some that are coming back again. So that's oh. good. You know, that is good. Yeah. Yeah, I my aunt she lives on the Washington side, and I have a cousin in Portland. So yeah, it was really nice to come and visit and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. good. You have a lot of family in there. Sorry, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, I'm gonna show my video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I have I have a cousin who lives in Eugene, and then I have a cousin who lives in downtown Portland. Um, oh okay yeah she, she her family lives there she moved from here up there a while back and then my aunt lives in on the other side of the river so it's about huh? 30 minutes from portland so oh. it's really nice yeah. yeah oregon's really pretty i always look at the pictures <laughs> yeah i you know um my aunt's home she's she's in a small town in washington so there are a lot of trees and woods, and there's always great place to explore. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I saw a lot of birds and deer and animals. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but it's good to be home, though. You know, <laughs> yeah, nothing like home. <laughs> yeah, it's warm, but you know, it's it's California. I was up there during Christmas, and it was rainy and. So I miss the sun, yeah. and then now up there it's pretty sunny. It's really nice. Like, you like in the morning it's sixty degrees, and you mm -hmm. can take long hikes, and yeah, it's beautiful. Oh. So when you get a chance, you should go. Yeah, I want to go to Portland first. You know, just to, to see the the capital first, and then check out other places. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you know maybe toward fall there's gonna be more business opening and mm, and okay. yeah downtown portland there are great restaurants um you know and it's optional with masks up there so oh, so okay. you, yeah if you're vaccinated you they don't require but some store they will put sign in the front but yeah okay so people start to travel a little bit i've seen my family members they're traveling a little bit so oh that's, that's good. good i know i want to see my my grandma um in arizona she lives in Yuma. Okay. 
it's pretty hot over there. <laughs> so right I, now it is, but I think the fall is gonna be really pretty over there. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping. We always go to Mexico all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I want to come back to Mexico City down the line. Uh, I've never been to Mexico City when it's a little bit less. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited to travel maybe next year maybe canada a little bit it's it's uh touch and go with europe i know the tickets are very cheap right now yeah um, are. but i heard that coming back from europe it's you know you have to get tested a week before and mm -hmm. it's hard to come in so um but my uncle was telling me that you can buy a ticket to paris for 300 bucks one way wow, so, wow that's yeah. cheap for Paris? <laughs> yeah. I'm and like, can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's looking to go hiking over there uh, in Spain. So he's going to come to mm -hmm. Paris and then travel to Spain. So that's, I've only been to uh, Madrid. Okay. It was for a conference, but yeah, it was pretty pretty. It was actually pretty. Cool. Well, <laughs> yeah. Next year, everybody can travel a little more. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get cracking Raspberry Pi today. Um, let me log on to my Pi with Zoom real quick. And then hopefully I don't get echo. Let me mute on the Pi so I don't get echo. Um, I don't have camera on the other one on my monitor, but I'm going to be on for in case I need to share screen on the Pi. Okay. Okay. So, all right, everybody, welcome back or welcome to CIS 330 or 833B. Um, we are learning Raspberry Pi in this class and we are going to do some fun projects. Um, it's a little bit different than Arduino if those, for those of you who had me the last two weeks. Um, we will do some electronics, but we will program a little bit more in, in the Raspberry Pi itself. So we will do some server-based game. Uh, we will do some electronics um, to start, but we will get into a little bit of um, uh, music programming. Um, it's gonna be pretty fun. So we're gonna do some synthesizer. Um, on, on the Sonic Pi, it's a little bit different in that it uses Ruby, um, but we are, it's gonna be very close to Python. You're gonna like it. I think Ruby is very elegant. Um, and if you know Python, it's easy to troubleshoot in Ruby. So, um, and then we will look at some of the tools that Pi can have. And uh, Raspberry Pi is a very um, flexible system, um, but I wanna introduce you to other boards um, so in case you need to expand, you will be able to do that, okay? All right, so to start, I want to just do a brief run through with the course information and uh, a little bit of syllabus. Um, I know some of you have checked that out already. And we are going to set up our Raspberry Pi today. So if you have received the Canna Raspberry Pi kit, which is the yellow box, you can have that um, you know, ready, and then we can we can start working on getting it installed. And I'll talk about the process. Okay. So, um, one second. Did I not post? Oh yeah, I did post the syllabus on this one. Okay. Do you have any question for me before we start? If you don't have your Raspberry Pi kit yet because you didn't get a chance to go pick it up, that's okay. Um, I did post an announcement for how you can contact IMIC Innovation Center and you can uh, either call or send an email to Joseph or Abraham um, so you can set up a time to come in. They only open Monday through Thursday and it starts at 7 a.m. and they close at 5 p.m. Um, they are located in the Science Technology Building first floor. When you drive to the campus um, at Moreno Valley College, um, when you park near the library or the Science Technology Building, you're going to see construction there. They're right next to the construction site. So it's best that you call when you get there, and then they will direct you where to go. Um, so that way it's safe for you, okay? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go into screen share. And um, 
Let me pull the Zoom stuff up. Okay. So this course is a non-credit course. It is a second course of the certificate, uh, which is the IoT certificate with microcontroller and embedded system. Uh, and if you finish all three classes, you will get the certificate. I haven't had a chance to send out the batch for the last class. I'm working on that today. I'm just trying to get your grade submitted because non-credit course is a little tricky in that um, web advisor doesn't always see it. So I'm working with the director for non-credit to fix some of the problems. So. Um, but I have finished all the grading from the 833A. So for those of you who took that class, you should be able to see your grade on Canvas. And then I will submit my grade. Um, I tried doing it five times last night and it wasn't cooperating. So I had sent a work ticket. Um, so they're, they're troubleshooting it today. All right, so this is the second course in the certificate series. Um, this is going to focus on embedded system and particularly Raspberry Pi. I will introduce you to what would be an embedded system uh, as some of you will be, you know, programming or doing security uh, management on some of them. IoT is very common as those of you who use smartphones or if you use smart devices like your Fitbit, things like that. So you would see these type of systems being, you know, incorporated, not just for personal use, but for business use as well. So we are going to meet um, every day uh, at two to four. And I normally walk you through the exercises and giving you a little bit of lecture to explain and introduce you to the technology. Um, since we have a holiday yesterday, um, we do have an option to either meet on Friday to make up the session or I can extend the session like about 15, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, like we will finish at 4.15 instead of four um, every day so that we will can make up the time, okay? But you will get um, all the activities and the things that would be fulfilling the objectives. So in this course, we are gonna cover Raspberry Pi basics. Um, we are gonna work with Linux, which is Raspbian. Um, it's part of the, it would be the operating system that you would use with Raspberry Pi, but in embedded system, you're gonna see different releases of Linux being used. Um, the reason why is that most of the releases are open source. And so it is easier for um, engineers and developers to really build the system upon it. And also Linux has great program tools that you can use. Um, so you do see a lot of the uh, Linux operating system is going to be incorporated. However, you can install Windows IoT on your Raspberry Pi. Um, it, it requires a little bit of configuration, but you can definitely run Windows on it. And um, there are other operating system options for embedded systems, but the majority you're going to see that's going to be Linux based. So we will touch on how to use Linux, how to use Linux command, at least for Debian release. Um, and then how to really navigate the operating system in Raspberry Pi. Um, starting this week, we are gonna work with GPIO. It stands for General Purpose Input Output. This is the pins, it has 40 pins that's located on the left side of your Raspberry Pi. We will connect wires and devices to it. And I'll talk about HAT, which is hardware attached on top. Um, so any kind of sensor that um, that is not incorporated with the system, you can either build it into a circuit like what you would in with Arduino, or you can buy a hat um, IC, which is um, integrated circuits that have sensor built in um, to be able to adapt it. So what am I talking about? What if you wanted to make a device that sends heat um, or if you want to make the device that would sense moisture, right? Um, so you can adapt hat or you can use the sensor to adapt that to a breadboard, um, you know, so that way you would have a circuit to be connecting. The majority of the time we are going to program in Python um, and I will instruct it, uh, the, 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 pro the activities using idle, 
but Raspberry Pi does come with other IDEs and you can definitely install other IDE with it. Um, we'll touch on Genie and um, if you take my Python class, you will probably be familiar. I, I prefer to use Tawny, but in this one, I will instruct uh, with you know using Idle, which comes equipped with the Python packages that you install. And Raspberry Pi comes with Python 2.7 um, and Python 2.7 is no longer supported by the community. Um, it's still being used, however, in the industry and the syntax for 2.7 is very close to the 3.x. I think right now they're at 3.9. So, um, and then we'll talk about, you know, programming logic, um, looking at how we can create containers like variables. And you start seeing some of that in this week activity when we program LEDs. Um, and then we will look at containers, larger container than the variable will be list. Uh, so for example, if we, we can use list to store notes, right, um, for our, our music and we can program sound, um, we will use iterations and conditions, um, which is when we would implement certain condition in the program. So for example, like we can turn on the light right um if certain condition is met such as if you click a button or if you press a button on your your circuit uh, and so on okay we will work with for loops quite a bit in iteration and um in python there are only two main loops um you're gonna see for loop and you're gonna see while uh, python doesn't really use do while you can because it's C-based, but the, the majority of the time you would see that while loop is being used. And we'll talk about different loops and how we can iterate and have it automated so it can loop through. So you would see some of that this week. Um, we will work with range, length, um, some of the built-in method for Python library, um, and then how to really write statements and conditions. And um, using the IDE, which is which stands for Integrated Development Environment, it's just an application that you would use to write your code or your script. So Python, we call it script. We don't call it code, right? And um, and then it also have a way for you to run it. And Python uses interpreter, so it doesn't work like how you would see with C plus plus or C. Um, in C, C++, and Java, they, those languages use compiler. That means that it has to compile your entire program before it can execute it. With Python, it's a little bit lighter um, in that it uses interpreter, so it interprets each line. And so when it runs into error, it will stop at the line that it comes across as error. So um, however, you can still build um, object-oriented applications. Um, so Python is very flexible. It's very popular. You see a lot of jobs for it. And having the Raspberry Pi knowledge is going to give you a little bit more flexibility as far as, you know, developing your career um, and just learning in general. Having that knowledge is also essential. Okay. So we will work with the Raspberry Pi, knowing how to interfaces, um, working with bus. And bus is basically just a... a a path and how we would connect different type of devices or components to it. Um, and some bus is faster than other. So think of it like the highway to your micro boards or your system. Uh, your computer has buses um, to connect video cards, to connect sound, to connect ethernet or ultimately your internet. Um, and also, you would see embedded system. Sometimes embedded system would have microcontrollers uh, processor uh, built into it. And the, the, the main difference between embedded system and microcontroller in that embedded system would use um, some kind of applications or, or um, operating system to really manage the resources. And so your PC is an embedded system. Microcontroller is much simpler. It's really made to really execute simple tasks like blinking lights, um, you know, turn on thermostat, um, things like that, where you don't have extensive menus 
and uh, options in how you would manage that device. So IoT device like uh, your wearable watch, um, your health uh, sensors, your smartphones, um, all of those have some form of either, you know, application oriented or it would be operating system oriented. Many of them run Linux in the back. Um, so when you're looking at your, like your cable box that you use at home, that's actually an embedded system, right? Uh, it has a full OS with incorporated menus and applications that you can change and you can configure and so on. So, um, so we will touch on, you know, some areas that were related to microcontrollers, and um, and how we can make Raspberry Pi into an Internet of Things, a device that would connect to the Internet, and we can have it automated. For example, we can make a device that tweets, um, um, like we can create even a surveillance system using a camera module and, you know, activate it. Um, I have done um, like teddy bear cam for little kids um, using Raspberry Pi before. So, and then, you know, um, <clears throat> you can have it connected to a cloud server um, and then be able to, you know, even send out information. So I've done like photo booth that tweets out the picture um, and so on. So. Raspberry Pi is definitely a fun device to work with. Um, it's very flexible. It has a lot of capability. So the objective in this class, the learning outcome um, are these threes. Um, we are gonna touch on the architecture of the embedded system, Raspberry Pi looking at hardware components, functionality and features. We are gonna install and navigate embedded Linux operating system, which is Raspbian um, and we can configure uh, and the settings. So we're gonna start doing that today. And then we are gonna use programming language such as Python to write instructions for our system to do certain things, to work with electronic components with GPIO, and then also to set up communications with servers and so on. So these are the main things, three things that we are gonna hit by the end of the class, okay? Any question with this? Okay, so no textbook requirement. I um, mainly put together presentation and instructions for you to use so you don't have to buy the book. However, if you prefer to get a book um, to really continue and learn, you can, but raspberrypi.org has great, great tutorials and instructables and Hack.io. There are a lot of really great resources online that you can use as well. But if you prefer to get a book, I recommend this book. Um, this actually takes you to the advanced level. So after this class, this book will fit in. Okay, so it talks about how you can work with the buses and so on. So no book requirement. Um, because this course is two weeks long, I generally just want to accept, you know, late work within the two weeks. Um, if you do submit late, there's some deduction with that. I don't take anything after two weeks because our course is already ending at the end of the week too. Um, you will have weekly assignments. So I break the module up into three parts in general for this class. Um, you will have an assignment. We will do the, the assignment the first two day in the week. And then we will do the lab in the, the last two days of the week and then the quiz is just general, you know, assessment on what you understand from the concept from the lessons that we go over. And it's multiple choice for our quiz. Um, you have three attempts and they're really short. They're like five to 10 questions. You only have two quizzes. There's no final, no midterm, you know, it's a non-credit course, so it's supposed to be easy. Okay, so make sure that we check out the due date for the assignment. Um, and then you will have labs. So our assignments are going to be hands-on. Lab is going to be hands-on. Quiz is going to be multiple choice. And everything needs to be completed and submitted um, before the course ends. Okay. So I will remind you of the, that, the deadline and things like that uh, toward next week. So if you had missed something, um, you can go back and, and complete them. Okay. So let's see, as far as grading goes, 
Um, quizzes are 20% of your grade. Your assignments and participation is 40% of your grade. Um, your lab activities are 40% of your grade. So altogether, that will be 100%. I will give you maybe one or two extra credit opportunity. And so if that will offset anything that you missed, right? Like let's say you just didn't take a quiz or you had missed an assignment. If you've done one, you know, one of those extra credit, that will help lift it up a little bit. Um, so I will add that, the extra credit at the end. Okay, so um, I do take attendance because that's part of the non-credit requirement, but I usually just check Zoom and I would ask you to type in your name at the end just to make sure that I have everything. Um, but if you miss class because of work or kids or anything, um, just drop me an email and if you complete the assignments and you got the lesson objective, I'm generally flexible with that. So, um, you know, if you have things that come up or if you have an interview, just let me know, right? You can send a Canvas message or you can send an email, okay? Um, in this course, it's, you know, we don't have too many projects, but the project that we do usually would require some class time. So I will do those with you. Um, and so just do your own script and work, okay? And you will, you will likely need some kind of camera system like your smartphone or your webcam to take a picture of, you know, your circuit or your, um, the output on screen or something like that if you don't know how to do screenshot. And then you can just submit the pictures. I generally require those, just proof that you have done it, okay? My information is here. If you call this number, it will go to my desk, which I can access the voicemail. Um, it would be best if you send me an email. I, I am pretty responsive in email. So if you have questions or concern, I do have office hours, even though it's not required for summer session. But after Tuesday, after this class, I will hold office hours. So if you are stuck on something and you, you can't solve it, you don't know why your script doesn't work, um, you can pop in. And uh, if, if you come in and if there's a student there, I would usually let you know uh, via the chat message. And then I will let you in once um, I'm finished with another student. Okay, so I have an hour. And the Zoom link for that is a separate Zoom link. So it's there and it's also in the course module. Okay. And I normally reply to your email within 24 hour um, and or sooner, usually pretty fast. Okay. Any question? Okay, so this is the syllabus. You can find this in the welcome module. You can also download it if you wish to. Um, and you can see that there, okay? So if you click module, you can find all the course information. Okay, so um, I posted some Raspberry Pi resources. So if you want additional resources, you can also find that there. If you didn't check out equipment, you can click on this page and you would be able to contact them. Um, and I also post posted an announcement for you, okay? All right. Okay, so when we're done with the class, you can return the equipment to iMake Innovation Center um, by July 29th, which is the end of the semester. Um, and then they will check you out for that, okay? Check you off the list. If you need Office 365, you can find the information on how to download it for your computer. I generally use Microsoft Word because that's what MEC uses, but I know that some of you have Mac or MacBook. Um, you might not have it have it installed. So you, as a student, you have two year free license um, with Microsoft. And it's part of the umbrella licensing that, um, that they, they pay for, that the RCCD pays for, okay? I also included the weekly schedule. Um, I do update this in case, you know, if there's something that's delayed so you can find out like what's needed. Okay, so I see a chat question.
no you don't have to you oh can you buy it um you i don't i think i make innovation center they they haven't really sold stuff and so there's process in how you would pay the foundation it's a little bit different with public school in that if you buy it the money has to go through an entity called california community college foundation and every college would have a foundation that's when they would receive money um, student services they have their own accountable accounting system and and finance system where academics we don't really have much of that but i think they they are setting that up um, the kind of kit that you're getting is a more expensive kit um, you can I would recommend that, you know, if you can't buy it from iMake Innovation Center, you can find equivalent kits on Amazon. Um, Elegoo makes good kits um, with Raspberry Pi. There are other entity that makes good kits. Um, you, all you need really is an HDMI cable, uh, you know, your Raspberry Pi, which costs about $35 to $50. It depends on the RAM that, that, that you prefer. Um, and then maybe some electronic components. So um, you can find that. And toward the end, I can show you where you can, which kits are probably be good if you wanted to start out. There are different Pi versions. So, you know, if you don't wanna spend the $35, you can you can use Pi Zero um, W, which also has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capability. Um, in the other class, the third class, um, I will go over Pi Zero and or you can also use Arduino with Wi-Fi capability uh, to be able to create your IoT device. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Preferably, you can return it by July 29th. But if you're you know a few days late, it's not going to matter um, because they keep a log of who checked out the equipment. And I know some of my students that took the Python for IoT, they also checked that out. So, um, but you, if you wanted to buy your own down the line, you can. I suggest that you do if you want to keep learning. Okay. Any question regarding course information? Just the basics. Um, <clears throat> okay. If we get off Amazon, which one we'll have to get? Okay. So let's do that real quick. So if you simply just search, right? Like I'm using Google right now. And let's say that um, I look for a Pi, a Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> the one that you want to get that's the newest and fastest is going to be Raspberry Pi 4, OK? And this one only comes with the case, OK? So it comes with just the case. And so what you need is um, you want to have some kind of power cable. So if it comes with a power cable like this, that's good. Um, otherwise, you have to buy it as an accessories. So at least at the minimal, you need to get a Pi 4. Um, it needs to have some kind of cooling component. So these blue things right here are heat sink and there are little metal fins that you would put on your chip or, or your processor on the board and I'll show you how to do that today. Um, it's designed to draw heat from the processor because the processor they run very hot. So a kit like this will be the minimal so you won't be able to do much electronics with it but you can definitely um, add. Okay so how do I connect to VNC? So I will touch on that when we when we uh, talk about BNC. Okay, so give me a little bit of time, and we we will work on that. Okay, yep. Okay, so um, some of the other kits that you will find that would have. Let me see if they have something that will be more complete. So let's say that I get a larger kit. Okay, Sun Founder makes pretty good kit as well. So if you wanted to go a little bit 
more advanced with electronics, you can also get this kit. Okay, remember that we want Pi 4 Model B. And this is a starter kit. It's really designed for you to adapt electronics to it. Okay, so it should come with, you know, cables. This is a GPIO cable. This is similar to the old hard drive uh, cable, the, the, uh, the SATA cable that they would use back then. Uh, not SATA, but the PETA cable. Um, and it should come with a breadboard like this. Okay, so you can buy something like this um, if you want more of a complete kit and they would run about, about $35.99. But remember that, you know, when you're looking at your Raspberry Pi and your boards, you just got to make sure that you check out the proper model. And since it's open source license, sometimes it looks a little bit different, but they would have the proper so this one, um, you know, you just got to remember that to check. So this is a zero, okay? And it has a GPIO. So it's a little bit different than your, your regular Pi 4, but it will work with that. Okay. And so there are many different types of kits that are available as well. Okay, I don't have an extra screen on the Pi 4. I can add the app Team Viewer, but it's sometimes, yeah, Team Viewer is a little glitchy. Um, you can use Putty. Okay, you can use Putty to connect to remote to it, but it's going to give you the, the screen is pretty small. It's not going to be large. Um, so you, or Real VNC would also allow you to do that as well. All right, any other questions regarding kids? Okay, so just make sure that you check out the proper model because sometimes it comes with the accessories, like, but it doesn't come with the Raspberry Pi and then you have to buy it separately. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, let's, if you have questions, you can also post it there. Let's talk about what we have to do this week. We are gonna start with Raspberry Pi model uh, B. We are going to um, we are going to look at the features and the functions in the Raspberry Pi, and then we are going to uh, write the programs in the Raspberry Pi. I'm gonna use uh, commands. Okay, so I will post the video at the end of the session um, in the evening as soon as YouTube will give it to me and I will link it to your, your class. Um, so now, right now, I wanna go over this real quick and then uh, we will work on how to set up your Raspberry Pi. Okay, so you can download that or view within the actual page. It will let you do the same. Okay, so let's show this real quick. Okay, so we are going to look at Raspberry Pi uh, and different type and different models. Um, the difference between Pi 4 and Pi 3B plus. Um, I previously taught Raspberry Pi with three. Um, and then we will touch on what makes them different, um, what kind of processor they have, what kind of components we can use with it. Um, yes. There are different type of pies. There's so many different models for development. And then I will also share with you the other type of boards that you can use, like from Texas Instrument or you do. So, all right. So for Raspberry Pi, uh, we would first have to really look at what makes an embedded system. And an embedded system basically would have a compilation of your computer hardware, software, firmware, and it's really aimed toward doing a specific thing. So when you're looking at your Fitbit, um, Fitbit is really designed to measure your health status, right? Like your heart rate, um, you know, the, the miles that you walk or the calories that you burn, etc. So it's really aimed for a specific function. 
Now you also have more industrial and in embedded system that's designed to, let's say, uh, create moldings, um, mix um, ingredients for food, um, like cereal um, or even packaging, um, things like that. So you would see embedded system being used for specific purposes in the, the industrial sense. And whether they're connected to the internet or not, most of the, the, the time they are connected to some form of network. So it has to have some kind of communication. Um, so whenever you go to a store, if you ever use Coinstar, right? Coinstar in the back is a computer. It actually run Windows in the back um, and it just have an overlay applications. Um, Asus will talk about that in the front. So what you see is really Coinstar is designed to count coins, right? And it would say how, how much money, how many joint coins that you drop in there and that's equivalent to dollars. And then it will give you a receipt so you can cash that in. So that's also in an embedded system. Um, so the example of embedded system can be consumer electronics that you see, that you use your smartphones, um, you know, some of the smart devices that you can wear, your car, um, all cars have computer computer boards. So you want you would see that uh, surveillance system, digital watches like you know your iWatch, your household appliances, refrigerators, um, stove, all of the smart appliances now they are embedded system. Even some toys also are embedded system and drones. So you see a vast uh, different, type of devices that will fall under the category of embedded system. Now, the argument is that, is it really that they have to have some kind of interface? Not necessarily. Um, the majority of them do. So you would have some kind of user interface for control purposes. And then in, in many devices, you would have graphical user interface like your smartphone. You would have a full operating system with graphical user interface or sometimes you just have a UI in that you would use control like your TV. Um, your TV has is an embedded system in that it has boards, right? It, it is a complex type of system that would have some computer hardware, firmware, and even applications designed for specific purposes. So your television nowadays is an embedded system. So, um, so what would be UI? That would be buttons, menu, touchscreen, um, some kind of sensing capability as well, okay? Um, the majority of the time, yes, in the back, okay? So Raspberry Pi in, the, in its case and development boards, you can use it for development, um, advancing your development skills or creating programmable projects. Now, some system, all systems are programmable in a sense that some system, they will lock the capability of programmability that only certain um, entity would have the privilege for that or uh, you would require certain permission. So in industrial sense, if you're looking at manufacturing company, right, you don't want people to go in there and program it all the time. You want certain people to be able to do that. So this is when the security comes in is that we wanted to really look at how the system is used and who has access to that system and how it's connected so that way you can protect the resources. Because imagine for a plant, let's say that they're, they, they make massive production of something and they're using embedded system, right? Um, if everybody goes is capable of going in there and changing things up, that can cause you know inter interruption, disruption in their business. So in you know you would see that for the majority of the time that it is programmable, um, whether it would be user sense or sometimes that could be um, very limited to specific user. Okay, and then some of the well-known manufacturer, as you see, it would be Texas Instrument, um, IBM, Apple, or even HP. And then there are specific manufacturer that would make, you know, for industrial use and they would use specific boards, right? Um, so when you, when you look up Texas Instrument, they have the educational side and then they have the business to business side for embedded systems. Um, same thing with IBM and so on. Okay. Any questions? All right.
Okay. So um, a little bit more on this. So why was it really created, right? Um, compared to your PCs and things like that, because your PC is an embedded system. Well, what if you want it on a simpler, low cost base? Um, because if it's massively used and you have to, you, to be able to sell it or produce in mass quantity, you want to cut back on the costs. So for example, like cable box, right? Um, you would see that it needs to be in, in somewhat of a low cost where consumer can afford it after the business sell it to them. Um, so, you know, when you lease it, basically you're paying up front for the first couple of years for its cost. So a lot of it is cost driven. And then the second part of it is power consumption. You don't want something that consume massive power. Um, so when you look at Raspberry Pi, it's pretty low power. Um, and the more advanced that we go with technology, the less power that's consumed. So it's more efficient. Um, so in a sense that, you know, whether should you use more complex system to really do things? Well, sometimes you just need to use simple system for that specific task. Um, so, you know, so you should think of it as a small computer. It, it is a small computer and it's really aimed to execute, you know, an objective, right? Um, in some sense, some system will be able to control mechanical, okay? And then other system will be able to control electrical. So you would have, you know, embedded system in different areas and sometimes both, okay? And since we need to be able to communicate with these systems, they need to have some kind of communication protocols, whether it would be very, you know, mainstream like Raspberry Pi where, you know, we can have it web enhanced, web ready, um, or, or it could be very specific in the protocol, how it would only communicate with specific systems. So there gotta be some kind of communication protocol incorporated. And the processors, the majority of the time you would see microprocessors that's adapted onto these boards. They are chips, right? And the microprocessor is gonna be the brain of that particular board. And some would also include microcontroller. Um, so you would have both on the same board or sometimes you would have one or the other, okay? And what they would use is they would use, I call them ICs um, or IC2. Those are gonna be used as integrated circuit for computing power. ICs are normally adapted just to manage power for the device. So um, as some of you already work with sensor and Arduino class, you're familiar with the integrated circuit on the basic level. Um, but what you see is they would be adapted. So that way there would be uh, managing management in the computing sense for power. And for the ones that have operating system, they would use what's called real-time operating system or RTOS to really be able to communicate with the hardware. And in operating system design, you would have a hardware abstraction layer. That's gonna be a layer that you don't normally see as a user. It's a way to really you know, communicate with the actual hardware and that's when the instruction is, is really being utilized for IO. Um, all, all, your, all your hardware is gonna be either input or output because the design for the computer systems, it has to have some form of input and output or output, okay? So the embedded Linux that you see is close to real time, right? Um, some, some OS will be real time, but I always, you know, I argue this all the time that I, I feel that it's close to real time. It's never truly real time right um in the sense so you would see some program that we would use that we would incorporate time into the function of that program and we would see how that would can be carried out through the operating system through the applications and then eventually the instruction is passed to the hardware okay so some linux releases can be incorporated with raspberry pi um, Pi, you can also install Kali Linux on it because it's Debian. A lot of the Debian releases will work with Raspberry Pi. Um, you can also install Windows IoT. And on the application sense, you would see embedded Java um, or you know some kind of application that's written in programming language. So embedded Java is very 
very common. Um, you see Oracle type of embedded Java uh, applications being used for embedded system. Okay, any question? So learn Java if you wanted to really get in depth with embedded system, right? So a good example for this is Android, right? Android, it runs Linux, but the application is written in using Android SDK uh, with Java, okay? So, and Java is different than JavaScript. People mix them up, but they are different languages. So you would see that, you know, when you write application for Android system, which is an embedded system, it you need to have knowledge in Java and then, you know, you need to be able to utilize Android library um, to be able to incorporate the bells and whistles for your app. Okay. Um, embedded system will also have sensors. Okay. And basically all that is, is most of the time it's a small integrated circuit board that would have some kind of data sense using electrical signal. So you can incorporate ultrasonic sensor, you can incorporate all the sensors that I've touched on in Arduino or other classes. So you would see that, you know, camera system to really, you can do image recognition and so on. It's really how you program these sensors, what, what you want it to do, right? So you can incorporate sensors. It also have analog to digital signals. So they call it A to D converter. And you would see some of that using your GPIO this week. Uh, Android uses Java with Android libraries. Um, it has specific libraries and with the libraries you would be able to, to use more on the, the input output perspective in how you would control your screen um, speakers. So if I write an app that is a game app, I want sound and I want image, right? Um, I want the user to be able to zoom in or navigate through using the touch screen. So with that, you still have to program it to talk to the hardware. And Android has this software development kit, you know, so you can, and you can bring in other libraries and other packages. So that way it will be able to do what you want to do for your app. So when you hear Android, um, it uses Java with, with, with Android SDK. Okay, so the native language is Java. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And then you also would see actuator. Um, this is gonna be for memory, or memory storage and for the output. So that way it can go to the right location in the memory to be able to pull the data. Um, all of these micro boards, you would see that it has memory built in. So when you buy your Raspberry Pi 4B, they will say one gigabyte, two gigabyte, three gigabyte. Same thing like your PC, right? When you shop for a laptop or your computer, you care about the memory because software requires that. Application, we program to really access different memory location to really pull the data that we need to play that game or execute that instruction. So, so the embedded system, it uses what's called the actuator. And what it does is it's gonna look at the output to memory, how it's stored and really choose the, the, the appropriate location, right? And also where that needs to be mapped to, to be able to pull the data. Um, so it's a little, you know, on in the back, that's what you would see, okay? So in structure diagram, how does this really tie back to the, the computer? So based on von Neumann, right? Um, von Neumann model, for those of you who took my CIS classes before I touch on this, but von Neumann came up with the model saying that all computing system needs to have storage, which is usually memory, needs to have processor, to be able to do arithmetic calculations, to be, you know, to be able to see data, interpret data, it needs to have some kind of input and output. So when you come back to it, really the way that we, we look at embedded system, it really ties back to how we utilize the memory, right? Um, so your sensor uses memory, your digital and analog 
components. So when I say analog, what do I really mean? Sound, right, uses analog signal because they're waves. Um, they're not zero or one. They can be varied throughout, right? You can hear loud noise or you can hear low noise. So in that, you have analog signals. So when you talk on your phone, what, what you speak, that's transferred in sound wave and that is an analog signal. Your smartphone is an embedded device. It takes that sound signal and it converts the analog signal to digital, right? We now use completely digital system. So in order for your message in your from your mouth to the phone and to your friend when you're speaking to that person, it needs to convert it. Back in the day, all most of our communication system uses analog signal. So it's just, you know, transferring waves across. But at nowadays we digitize that. So it converts it. So your embedded system, the modern embedded system, you would see that it needs to convert analog signal to digital and it uses digital to be able to transfer. So everything in the network environment, in your internet, all of that is digital. So when you play a music video, right, what you hear is your computer, your embedded system, converting everything from digital to analog so you can hear the sound in human ears, okay? So when you look at embedded system, the majority of the time you're gonna see AD converter. And then you would have a processor and that processor is gonna be the, it's gonna be able to compute, right? It's the brain. So microprocessor is designed to look at logic right? So that way it can compute. It's basically, uh, it calculates your data, what you're giving it, okay? And ultimately, I tell my students, your computer is just a calculator. It ultimately, when it comes back to it on the lowest end, like the low level, it is a calculator, okay? And it needs to have memory storage to really refer to. So this is why when you install software, it tells you, right, the minimum requirement to install this app is, right, you need to have this type of processor, you need to have memory, you need to have some kind of storage, right? Um, if you install like a very heavy uh, image type of application, like a game, it will require additional storage for that image to really come through, right, for rendering and all of that, okay? Is, is an analog. A stick, I don't understand what your a stick means. I think I think I'm referring to the, the joysticks, you know, and the, and the control. Oh, okay. Yeah, so all your controllers, like your buttons, your joystick, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you press a button, it activates something, they are digitized, okay? Okay. Um, the, the, the things that would be analogs are motors, right? Things, knobs that you turn, like in your car, you turn on your volume and the, the more you rotate on the right, right? It's gonna be louder, right? Um, or lights at home, if you have those, those you know, ambience dim lights where you can turn a knob and it changes the level. So what they did with that is lights can be digital where it, it would turn on and off. But if you convert it into a wave where you would use a variance in, in how you control the electrical signal, you can cut it into you know, dim, dim, you know, really dark, right? Really bright or in the middle, okay? Oh. So when you use anything that's adjustable with a knob or rotate or things that would be in range, that will be usually analog signal. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. So yeah, so your game controllers, the buttons that you press, usually it's digitized because it's either press or no press, okay? That means on yeah. or off, that's it. Right, so you can give it full electrical signal. And if you remove your finger, it just cuts off that signal. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so in a sense, like, you know, if, if you have something that's um, like scrolling or adjusting on that controller, right? Like I can, I can drag it and it's actually ranging from like low to high, then yeah, that will likely have some kind of analog uh, converter with that. Okay. You know how the, the new PlayStation um, controllers, the PS4, 
they had like a little speaker inside is that an example of analog or yeah so the, okay. if you if you are doing voice command to it like your alexa and all of that mm -hmm. um, it needs to convert yeah it needs to receive analog signal and convert it so what happened is you're going to have the ad first right and then so you need to convert sound waves to digital way right it's either on and off and then the computer would do something with that it will store that 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 command in your from your voice and convert it so when you say turn on lights right it takes whatever you said convert it to some form of digital instruction store it and then execute it right and then Alexa will tell you, or the control will tell you, done, right? I did it, right? Or some yeah, kind of message. Right. Uh -huh. So at that point, if Alexa tells me that she's done whatever I told her to do, then that means that it converts it back. So you have the D to A, you know, so that way you can hear what Alexa tells you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you would have the actuator. So all of these things come together and you would have an embedded system. All of these are the elements of the embedded system and what makes it an embedded system, right? Okay. This is actually embedded system alone and how to design and, and engineer it is an actual course. So for those of you who pursue like, you know, computer engineer um, and, or, you know, even electrical engineer, uh, electronics engineer, I should say, my aunt corrected me the other day about that. But yeah, so you might be able to, to really get a little bit further concept with, with university. Okay, so on the software end, I just wanna run through this real quick so you can have a better understanding on how, how programs and scripts are written for embedded system, okay? The majority of the time, all your application have some kind of loops. Everything that you use have loops, okay? from your smartphone to your car to whatever, okay? Um, and conditions. So on the low level, it has to have a way to really repeat certain things, right? Repeat a task. Um, so if, if, if I call on Alexa, she would know and it understands. So that they just implemented a condition, right? When it hears Alexa in some form, it will wake up. Okay, and then with that, they would implement <clears throat> subroutines or instructions for the processor to really understand what it needs to do. It's like telling a, a, someone in your family to go do this, like take out the trash, right? And when you implement the loop, that would be like, take out the trash every night at 9 p.m., okay? So that way that person is in, in an automated routine hence the name subroutine, right? It's executing that task. And if we put it into a loop, it will continue that process repeatedly, okay? We can iterate through it or we can implement some kind of condition with it. Like while it's doing this, it can also do another thing, right? Um, and then we can also, we need to make sure that we can interrupt, right? An interrupt could be that, you know, when something is pressed. so. When, whenever that, you know, you, whenever your computer is stuck on Windows PC, right, like you would do control alt delete to go to task manager, right? When you do that, it generates an interrupt, okay? And embedded system has that, computer system has that. So it needs to really see, okay, when certain things happen, like a key is pressed, which it receives a signal from the keyboard, then it's gonna pause whatever it's doing and it's gonna focus on that. It's gonna say, okay, what do you want? It's like a, a child raising a hand in the classroom. The teacher is talking and she sees or he sees or they see the hand goes up. Then it's just, you know, that the teacher stops and say, okay, what, what's your question, right? So it's exactly that. We really design our, our computing system to be like us, right? To do the things that we can or cannot do so it really mimic like the human. So there's a gen, uh, an interrupt can be generated and that is usually either triggered, right? Like when you press control alt delete, that's triggered. Or it could be that it's based on a certain condition, right? 
like 9 p.m., right, take out the trash. <laughs> um, so that means that we would then have to follow and execute a certain task. Um, and then it needs to have some kind of multitasking, right? Because we want our system to be advanced in that it's able to handle various things and our processor is really designed to do that. Um, and in some sense, you would also have application program interface like API. Um, a common one that you would see with like server stuff is server authentication with Google API. If you ever sign in, if you use an app and it asks you to use your Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Google authentication, it's using an API, right? It just pull your data from the other application and tie that into the application you're using. So it's a way for application to talk to another application, hence the name application programming interface, okay? And then lastly, this would be multitasking with the operating system. Um, we need to really synchronize. Sometimes that will be time sensitive, right? Like imagine if you if you're exercising and it's not real time, it's not synchronizing with the real time, right? It's not tracking the heart rate like how you want it. You would not use that device again, right? So you do see some systems are better than other with that on how they designed it and how they really incorporate the ROTS and how it controls the hardware with that. So if you are taking the content of this class and you're thinking about like, how can I make an IoT that's really, that's really cool, that's really, you know, real time, that's, you really have to think about how, what type of instruction you're using, what type of software or operating system you're using with it, and how you're writing your, your script or your program to control your hardware components, okay? And in order to really switch the task in the minimal aspect, so the user doesn't have to wait five seconds for something to, to really kick in. Uh, because if I'm exercising for like 15 minutes, and if I have to wait like a good minute for things to really update, that's not really worth my time, right? So, um, so you have to really look at the investment in that aspect to really make it make it work. Okay. Any question? So I wanted to put these acronyms here. So in case you run in, into it, and you read it, you know what they are. Okay. And you, without getting into like, you know, uh, digital and, and all of the nitty gritty detail for electronics. Um, so you would hear the term IC, like I said, that stands for integrated circuit. It's the board. It's also having its own instruction firmware and stuff to really control the hardware. Could be for sensor, right? It could, so everything that you use electronics nowadays have some kind of IC, okay? And then um, you would see like VLSI or LSI. Um, this is really depending on the type of integration that you wanted to use. So in a very large sense, uh, VL sense more very large, you would use hundreds and thousands of transistors that would be incorporated into that chip. Whereas large scale, you would have microchips that contains transistors. So um, if you've taken my my CS 7011 before, you probably heard this already, right? Like if you're looking at like the Xbox, the processor that goes into the Xbox has billions, sometimes a lot more than that, right? And if you're not sure, you can Wikipedia it. You can say how many transistor is in, you know, PlayStation 4 or, or the processor for Xbox. It'll tell you, right? Wikipedia has a chart for it. And then on the medium scale, you would have less transistors. So the more, the more, the larger scale, the more complex, the more massive that you need to use the embedded system, like Xbox, you would have millions of, of transistors that's built into a chip and they're, they're small, right? Um, and then on the medium scale or the small scale, you would have less, okay? So if you're looking at a processor, if the more transistor that it has, you're gonna have more logic capability, um, you know, incorporated with the gates and the digital aspect. So in design aspect, you have to really look at the scale on how the embedded system will be as pertaining to its processor, okay? And the ultra large scales, right? 
we are in the millions for a lot of the things that we're using nowadays. Like your your computer processor, right? That's in the millions at least. Okay. Okay. Yeah, billions. Yep, that is correct, Cynthia. And so the more advanced things that we're asking the system to do, the more transistors we incorporate. Okay. All right. Um, Any Dr. Wynn? Yes. Yes. Question. Um, so I'm in that process of uh, building the computer, and I was wondering. I think I. I think I'm mistaken it, but the MSI. Um, I think I saw that when looking for a micro board or the motherboard. I'm sorry. Uh huh. Right. Um, I'm not sure though. <laughs> I have to research. That's fine. So the motherboard is like the nervous system. So when you look at the Raspberry Pi, right, itself is a board. Mm -hmm. And the difference between your PC motherboard and the Raspberry Pi board is in that your PC motherboard doesn't mm -hmm. have the, the, the processor soldered on compared to Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi, its processor, the Broadcom processor is already soldered on. It's the silver one in the middle. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So when you build a PC, you let's say you buy an MSI motherboard, you yeah. have to get a processor like i7 or i9 or Ryzen, right? AMD, um, and it needs to really fit. They're like, my analogy is like wheel and tires. So mm -hmm. you can't put the wrong tires on the uh, on a different size wheel. So they have to really be compatible physically, right, and logically. Okay, so the but the motherboard will tell you what type of processor it's capable of using. Like you can use, it's compatible with. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's it's socket based. So it, you know, it, I don't. Did you take my CS twenty five? I think we talked a little bit. About yeah, that. yeah. No, I remember that part. Um, it's just looking for the stuff. Yeah, it, it gets. Yeah. <laughs> so when you look at your Raspberry Pi right now, right, the silver square mm -hmm. on your board that's your your main processor and then you also have other chips right everything has a integrated circuit chip on it right you would have a chip for yeah. wi-fi you would have a chip for memory right i will show you a diagram shortly on what things are where things are so if you look at the powerpoint it has it okay yeah. okay so, uh -huh. So the silver one in the middle is the main brain, okay? All right, so we already talked about the example. 3D printers is also another embedded system, drone, right, uh, smartphones. Now we have smart buildings with, you know, digital walls and stuff, it's pretty cool. So you will see a lot of that uh, also in the future. So here it is, right? Um, so your processor is here. Okay, and um, now the old one, it uses the two point. So the three, the Raspberry Pi three uses the 1.2 gigahertz. That's the speed. So whenever you see frequency like Hertz, that's usually pertaining to speed. Okay, and um, it uses the, the, so on your smartphone, right? It has a processor and it would be a certain size. So when you shop for a phone, it will tell you like what kind, usually sometimes Cortex. I know Apple stopped using Cortex. Qualcomm produced a lot of the, the processor for a smartphone company. So you would see some of those, um, you know, Snapdragon, different variation of it anyway. And they all use ARM, which is the, the for that for, so every processor has its own architecture. So just think about like, kind of like, uh, how you are, you have certain ethnicity, right? Like you are from a certain race or, you know, be based on your upbringing or your background biologically. Uh, so it's very much like that. So ARM is used to, uh, for instructions on how these processor would execute what you're telling it at the higher level. Um, so on this, this is a, a, a risk architecture so it's ARM, the majority of the things that you see for smart devices would use ARM um, and for my student in assembly class. So you can use Raspberry Pi for ARM programming in assembly. Um, and it's a little bit different than your Java or CE or Python and so on. 
Okay. And then, um, so the instructions, this is the average that you would see, you would see like 700 million wet zone instructions per second, very fast. Okay. So it's able to perform that or higher. Okay. And so various models for the Raspberry Pi can go from $5 to $35. Um, they tried to keep it very uh, low cost because they wanted to make sure that people can buy it for educational purposes, okay? But you do see, I'm gonna show you one real quick. Let me pull up my, uh, there's a new board. I think I wanna get this. And this can be equivalent to some of your uh, PC. So AMD team up with a company or this company uses Ryzen. I don't know. This is like equivalent to your i7 and i9 series, the, the Ryzen or the i5 or the older one. So um, this is one of the later system, but if you look at it, right, it's not very large. It looks kind of like the Raspberry Pi, but a little larger. It's 12 by 12, okay? And it has a built-in uh, video. <clears throat> so you can buy something like this and run it as a PC. You can install it. The Out of the box, you can put Windows on it, Windows 10. It's You can add RAM to it. It has a, a, the board. It looks almost like a... a a, a regular motherboard for the PC. You can also add solid state drive to it. Um, they sell accessories with it. So it uses this and you can run, you can run x86 um, applications and software on it, which is great, right? You see a lot of 32-bit applications still floating around. So it's a little faster than your normal Pi. Okay, and you can program these guys too. Right, they're great, um, and you know, so you plug it in like a regular PC, and this uses a Vega Eight graphics, which has eight GPU. So if you're looking at like mining bitcoins or 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 even playing VR on this, it's capable of doing VR. You just gotta give it a lot of RAM, okay? Um, it uses Sodim, which which is the RAM that goes into the laptop, and you can find and it uses DDR four. So RAMs are not expensive on it. So you can go up to a 64-bit sodium socket, which is pretty high for, for something that tiny, okay? And then you, if you wanted to add in solid state drive, you can use the M.2, M okay? I'm super hardware nerd, so like, you know, this might be foreign to some of you that's not familiar with PC, but just in general, this system is capable of doing everything that your PC can do, right? Um, the equivalent of this, they said, is equivalent to the MacBook 13, right? Some of the recent MacBooks. So it's decent, okay? And um, so you can, you can use something like this. But this one is really cool in that it has a microcontroller chip, okay? And it, you, it has the Atmega, so if you're familiar with, so it has, it has the microprocessor and the microcontroller, okay? And if you took the Arduino class, Leonardo is another version of it. Um, you know, we use the Uno, which is a little bit less. So, and then if you look at the digital and the analog inputs and output for it, yeah, it stands up to something that would be equivalent to Arduino. So this is like, Arduino, 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 Leonardo, and Raspberry Pi had a baby, okay? But like a super baby. So um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I, you know, I really wanted to get this, but, you know, and then there are lesser model, um, you know, with cheaper, that's cheaper. So they range from like 100 to uh, about $500. Okay, which is what you would see with the regular desktop, computer desktop. Okay. So that's something that you would also see. All right. Um, so for the Raspberry Pi, so let's run through real quick. Right here is the GPIO. This is where you would plug your wires in. 
okay? And then um, your hat header is here. If you ever need to use this, this is usually for your camera. So you can buy the little camera module. They run about $12 to $20, depends on how many megapixel you want. Um, I've done like a photo booth project with Raspberry Pi. So I use it, the camera module usually come with the little ribbon cable and you would attach that there. But don't, don't bend the cable because those cables are super fragile. I made a mistake that I bought a super long cable and then I had to fold it up or roll it up. And yeah, you know, but the cables are generally like a couple dollars. And then here's where your SD card's gonna go. That's where your OS is gonna be stored. Um, is it a supercomputer? No, it's just a, a computer, right? Um, it's an embedded system, but I don't, you know, if we say supercomputer, supercomputer is able to compute at much higher levels. So it's a consumer system, right? You can use it as a regular computer or you can use it for specific things more on the embedded system. Yeah, you can definitely run AR and VR with that one, play games, uh, just add some RAM to it. All right, um, on the, the four compared to the three, you have USB-C for power and also a DC connection. So when you look at your Pi, you're gonna see that the, the round power connection is still there. That's your regular you know, DC connection and then you have the USB-C, which comes with your, with your um, kit. And US, you know, the, the great thing about these devices is, you know, it's, it's, it's power can be adapted with the USB. So it's fantastic, okay? And then it uses the micro HDMI, the smaller ones. It looks like the old USB, right? Um, your uh, your mini USB, but it's not, okay? And you're able to display at 4K. So the Pi 4 is definitely worth the money in my opinion. And if, if you buy it, you should get the two gig and above. So that way you can scale it for bigger things. Um, if you get one gig, it's okay, but it's gonna be limited um, down the line, okay? And then here it talks about the MIPI port. This is for camera right here. Okay. And then you can connect to e the, either one. And then your, your audio connection is here. And then it has two USB 2.0, two USB 3.0, and the 3.0 has the blue and the 2.0 has the black. It's just a standard color coding. So 3.0 is faster. Most of you probably know that. Um, but so you want to use from 3.0. Your keyboard and mouse and most of the common things that you buy, uh, they are operating at 2.0 mostly. They standardize at 2.0. You know, external hard drives and other things usually use like 3.0 or higher or external devices and so on. Sometimes you, for data transfer, 3.0 is better, okay? And then you have an ethernet connection. It does have a wireless uh, chip that's built in so you can connect via wireless and a Bluetooth, okay? And so it runs Linux um, and you can, if you're looking at Pi Zero, which is much smaller, it's gonna be less. So it doesn't have the GPIO unless you adapt to it with the pin. Okay. All right, so who really use Raspberry Pi? Students, uh, makers, people who like to build projects, hobbyists, um, really to really, you can prototype things with Raspberry Pi, but you cannot use Raspberry Pi for con consumer products. So let's say I've created a really cool device and I want to sell it. It cannot be Raspberry Pi. It can be other development boards that are similar to it, but it cannot be Raspberry Pi because of the licensing, okay? Um, so because it's, it's um, creative common open source license, you, it's really geared for nonprofit educational purposes. Um, but if you turn around and, and use it as a profitable thing, then you, you should consider using um, 
other development boards because they can come back and sue you. Okay. All right. Okay, so we can make robots with it. We can make Internet of Things, um, things like vending machines, Internet connected, interactive art, a game. Uh, you can do a, a little, you know, uh, retro game console with it. You can do a lot of things with Raspberry Pi. It's great. Okay, so we talked about the OS. So it uses Raspbian. Okay, Raspberry Pi with Debian, hence the name Raspbian. Um, and you can also install other OSs. Um, you can also put Ubuntu IoT on it, uh, Windows IoT, and other Kali. I've, I have one that runs Kali, and then I use like a little, little mini keyboard and a screen, and I put it in the lunchbox, and I usually show students, and they're excited about that, especially the younger ones. Um, so you can definitely run other OSs on it. So be careful with using it for commercialized projects, okay? So something that you can use for commercial projects are Beagle Bone, which is made by Texas Instrument. It runs about 100 and up. Um, I think they did drop the price on it. It's, um, I bought one and it was okay. It's, uh, it has similar capability. Um, Intel also produced a couple along, along with, you see like AMD and other companies have development boards that you can also acquire um, for research. And what we have the issues with Adreno of not being able to make profit. Yep. Um, Adreno license, well, the design, the schematic, you see that company use it to produce. Uh, you can find a company that has similar board uh, that also use something very close to it and they will be able to give you the, the, the capability to do that. But yeah, Arduino is another one. Okay. Take the, all away the fun from this, right? I mean, you want to sell your products, but yeah, there are other development board that looks very similar. You can use it. Okay, question. I know I looked at the Intel one a while back. It's just supply and demand too and how they keep the cost down. So here is a chart comparison for a different model, okay? So the first one that you've seen uh, um, way, way back, I remember when they first came out, they they call it Pi B. And if you look at some of the pictures, we, it changed quite a bit. So the Pi Zero is definitely smaller. It's cheaper, right? Like about $10, $12, um, it's slower and the RAM is gonna be limited, okay? But on average, you're gonna see that they range under a certain um, wattage for power consumption. It's really aimed for low power usage, okay? Um, and they wanted to really use micro SD to as your, your secondary storage outside of RAM. Um, and then on the Pi Zero and the Pi Four, they went to the micro HDMI instead of using the large, the main HDMI A, uh, because it's just take up less space. Okay. So you would need to have the micro HDMI cable for these. Um, and then on the old one, as you can see, it uses RCA and, but they did create an old development board. Actually, no, I should say old. This is a little bit more on the uh, on the less, uh, you know, you're not gonna get all the extra stuff with it. Um, it is slower, it has less RAM, um, but if you wanted to learn more electronic stuff, this, is, this would probably be a good one to look at, um, looking at electronic and how to incorporate components, okay? Almost all of them use dual core, except for the latest one is a quad core. Okay, so you get faster, newer Raspberry Pi. Okay, so on the Pi 4, it uses the Broadcom. It's a quad core Cortex A72, which is an ARMV8. Um, this is a similar chip that you see in some smartphones, okay? Um, and 
it's 64 bit. So the, the bench is going to be 1.5 gigahertz and, but you can amp it up to about double that. So you can turbo boost it if you, but remember it's going to run hot. So if you wanted to really use it for like Bitcoin mining or something a little bit more heavy, you can, um, it's just, you know, it, it might overheat. Um, just like any other processor, okay? So you have GPIO, we talked about that. You have a couple, a few five volt connections, okay? And the power is gonna come from your USB-C connection. It's gonna distribute it. So when you're looking at the GPIO on the top, you're gonna see some five volt. So do not throw away this card that comes in the box, but if you misplace it, you have to look online, okay? This is the layout of your input and output and which pin they are. So Arduino is very good at labeling their pins. Raspberry Pi, they don't label them. You use this card as a reference. So if you're looking at the card, the, the, top, the top left is gonna be 3.5 volt, okay, right here. And then right next to it is gonna be pin two is gonna be five volt. So if you wanted to connect five volt, you would go here, okay? So this is what you're gonna use to find out what everything's gonna be. And then if you need to connect ground, there's some ground. So the third pin, um, pin six is gonna be ground. So it's gonna go across. The closest to you is gonna be pin one, that's one. This, the next to it is going to be pin two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And there are specific things. So when they tell you, if you declare in your, your, your script, you know, pin 17, then you're going to go to GPIO 17, and that's the location for it. Okay. So don't throw away this card. You need it. All right. We talked that we talked about how it has, um, Bluetooth, and it works with AO211 AC. Some of the older one uses like N and so on, uh, but this one uses AC. So definitely faster for the wireless and better encryption for, um, for connection. And your camera, you can add in camera module. That's a 15 pin connector. It's, it's smaller than your 40 pin. And then it's, you know, you can use it for various things. I bought one that actually you can zoom in on it, um, you know, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You can do a lot with it. You can make it into a surveillance system if you want. Okay. And then for the display, we talked about HDMI and it uses DSI. <clears throat> so some of the things that you, you, you can, you should have with your Raspberry Pi if you only buy the Pi. You should have like a power cable for it, if not the USB-C. Um, and then you need to have micro SD. So on the Pi 4, the largest SD size that you can get is 64 gig, okay? If you buy one that's 128 gigs, it's only gonna see 64 gig. So when you format it and use it, it's only gonna see the maximum you know, storage. Down the line, yes, they can probably adapt higher, you know, so 64 gig is good. I think they, they gave you the 32 with your box. Um, you can use ethernet cable with it, keyboard case and so on. What are the hats? You can adapt the hats. They are little different boards for sensor, right? We can use it to sense temperature, moisture, um, distance, uh, you know, sound, Etc. They're they're endless different type of hats, um, and so if you're familiar with Arduino sensor, you can't adapt it. But Raspberry Pi requires also additional uh, board capability. So and the hats are a little bit more expensive. So you can buy a Raspberry Pi for thirty five dollars, and then if you wanted to adapt hats, some hats are like let's say, uh, you know. Uh, you wanted to do light sensing and some of those hats are like $24. It's just supply and demand also the production of it. 
um, you know, so they usually charge like in the 20s or sometimes 12 bucks. Um, so it varies. Okay. All right. Jumper wires, resistors, LEDs, breadboards. So if you get your kit, make sure that you get some of these with it. Okay. Things that we don't do with Raspberry Pi. Do not pull the power cable to shut it down. It has an operating system. So the way that you do that is I'm going to hold on one second. I'm going to share screen real quick. Let me stop share on this side. So uh, the way that you do that, so your control stuff is here. This is kind of like the start button, but if you're familiar with Mac OS and Linux, you know, everything is top. It's proper, it's appropriate design method that they implemented. So we read things from left to right, top down. So they put it on top. Only Microsoft does it from the bottom backwards. Um, but so, so this is where you would, you would be able to click your little Raspberry Pi button here, and then you would go shut down here to shut it down. Okay, do not just yank the power out because over time, you know, that will damage your Pi, and then all your applications and stuff that you need will be here. Okay, and yeah, you can definitely run Zoom on Raspberry Pi, just use the web, or you can also install the app. Okay. I found that the web base is, is easier. Okay. Any question? All right. Um, okay. Don't take your Raspberry Pi and put it in magnetic or metal area. Like if you have a file cabinet that's metal, don't just throw it in there without putting it in its cover. So do not put bare metal stuff with bare metal stuff because it will, um, it will destroy it over time so you can you should put it in a box or a case or something like that before you place it into the metal cabinet um, and just like anything else magnetic will probably ruin things over time especially your storage so uh, you know don't put it next to a magnet do not connect circuit that sync low currents so for the gpio um, so, you know, going from two mega ohm to, uh, to three, do not connect circuits that's power at five volt or board that will be destroyed. So um, you are, GPIO are generally 3.3 uh, .3 volts, but if you are driving motors and things like that, you need to connect at five volt. So if you're using five volt to power LED, you need to have resistors. And what resistor does, and if you're not, you don't know what resistors look like, they're like this, okay? Okay, they come with your box. Um, resistors is used to regulate the current. So you wanted to use the appropriate resistor in that range. If you don't have the exact, it's okay to use close to it, right? Uh, I mentioned this in the Adreno class, but some of you didn't have it. If you're using High value resistor, it's gonna be low current. If you're using low value resistor, you're gonna have higher current. So it's think of it kind of like if you put a filter, right, um, in in your in your water hose, right? You you can control on how the water would flow through based on that filter. But if you remove it, it will just be completely open. So you use resistor for that. So just you can short the board, that's what it's saying here, okay? Do not apply the power to GPIO header while the RP is not powered on, okay? So if you're trying to connect a battery or something to it, um, you also want to be mindful of the type of volts that you're giving it, right? Don't want to go over its limit and also be mindful of that, you know, make sure that it's on. So self power interface circuits are gated. So for the 3.3 volt supply line is, or use the uh, optocoupler. Okay, so a little bit more on the electronic side. So these are some of the things that you just need to watch out for. Okay, 
Um, operating system, these are some of your options. You can use Arch Linux, Open the ELEC, Electronics, which is more multimedia application. Um, it, it's not like what you normally see with the OS. And then uh, Windows 10 IoT, Ubuntu for ARM, Raspbian, uh, Kali for IoT. When you see the IoT next to the operating system name, and if it's capable of using ARM, you can use it because they wrote it for that with that particular set of instructions. So you'll find. Okay. So to I know that your Raspberry Pi comes with an image. Okay. It is the version that they put on it. I looked at the release. It, it that is the release from, from last year, uh, November. Okay. And in the Linux world, if it's past three, a few, uh, a month, it's already kind of dated, right? They have new releases all the time. And I also want you to use a full version of the Ras Raspberry Pi OS of Raspbian. Um, so, and the nickname of, of this particular operating system is called Buster, okay? Like kind of like, you know, how, how Android uh, would have like jelly beans, Kit Kat, ice cream. Um, their developer name, you know, their releases. So this is, I think, Buster version. I forgot which version, but its nickname is Buster. The prior, I've used Jesse and um, other ones, but, you know, so anytime that you install application or install any new packages or module, you need to push updates, okay? Because with the update, sometimes that would update the firmware, sometimes that would update, you know, other things with the OS. So safe to say every time that you install any software, okay, or any packages, any library, you need to push updates, okay? All right, so this link gives you the imager, which allows you to create an image for Raspberry Pi you need to download the imager and then you would need to take, what did I do with that? Um, the USB adapter that they gave you, this thing right here, okay? You open the cap, the top of the USB has two holes, okay? Do not put your SD card where there are open holes. You are going to put it in the slot beneath it, okay? So the, the, the SD, the micro SD that you have already have the OS, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna not use that version, we're gonna use the full version so you don't have to install applications and packages all the time. It has the full everything, okay? Uh, so you're gonna put the SD in there and then you are, once you, it's inserted, okay? Then you are gonna put that this, the USB to your USB port on your computer, okay? I also put a link for a tutorial video, but in the exercise that we're gonna do in class right now, we are gonna do one, okay? All right. This gives you a list of Linux commands that you can use, okay? We sometimes will do change directory. We can make a folder or a directory. Linux doesn't call a folder a folder, they call it a directory. Okay, CP for copy. If you're looking at a text file, you would do more to be able to scroll down and read. You can do touch to create an empty file and you can append text to it um, by doing echo, very similar to Windows command. LS is list, this is equivalent to DIR in Windows. So if you wanted to see what files is in a folder in your terminal, you would do LS, okay? and that will give you the content of that folder. Okay, so here are some shortcuts that you can use. Okay, so Linux is a little bit different than Windows. So you can do control A to bring, to move it back to the start line. Um, in terminal, you can also type clear where it clears out your, your terminal. I'll show you how to use that. Um, or you can also do control U, that's the same thing as clear command. Um, or control L for clear screen. So these are some of the shortcuts that you can use, okay? Up arrow for the repeat previous command, very similar to Windows command prompt. 
Um, and then you can do the tap key to auto complete the file directory or executable command. Okay. And then I'll come back to this when we talk about the Python tomorrow. Uh, because, you know, so we are going to use Python three, which is not installed. I previously put up the document, but I realized that um, I have I didn't write the instruction for you to install Python three. So I re I added the steps for the new document. Okay. So in programming, we are going to use the editor, which comes in idle. Idle is the IDE for Python. And when you're using idle, there's idle for the 2.7 and then there's idle three for Python three. They're two separate versions, okay? And then we'll talk about the fundamental tomorrow when we work on our lights, okay? So here are some resources you can check out some cool projects and we are going to work on blinking LEDs. Do you have any question for me? Okay. Uh, Dr. Wen. All right. Mm -hmm. So next, no question. Uh, Dr. Wen. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. That's um, okay. I, I already, are we supposed to put the micro SD already in the USB thing? It's not in the USB. It's actually in a separate package in the box. Oh. If you look at your Canakit box, there mm -hmm. is a package. It's like, um, so the USB, it's the black USB. It's, um, it's in a separate package. And then the micro SD, I think it comes in like a anti-static. It's a silver bag. Is this one? Okay. Oh, let me let me turn off my virtual background. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm in my sister's room right now. Is it this one? Yeah, I can't see from the inside. Yeah, open that. I think so. I okay. opened mine. Yeah. It, yeah, that looks like mine. Yeah. Yes. That yeah, yeah, that is it. It came. I yeah. And then I put it in here like this, right? It goes into inside this little slot. Yeah. So the slot that the yeah, the the one below the open one. So when you look at the USB. The USB has two holes that's open. Mm -hmm. It's the so the opposite side. Oh, okay. okay. And okay. it has a notch on the micro SD. So you 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 know, if you put it in the wrong way, it's not going to detect it. So yeah, you, okay. you, you just insert it and there's no spring for it to attach. So once it's flush in, then it's 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 in. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. So any other questions? Okay, so next what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the first exercise A. And that's all we're gonna do right now. Just to do exercise A and then tomorrow we're gonna do blinking LED. Okay, so let's walk through that. So you will find this in the week one assignment of our course in our module. And then I'll post the lab. I just got to fix some of the things on my script before I post it. Okay. Um, so let me get my camera. So when you look at the heat sink, they are the silver square pieces and there's a sticker on the back of them. So you need to peel out the blue the blue paper sticker, and then you need to, to stick each of the, the rectangular or the square heat sink onto your, onto your processor, okay? Your microprocessor. Okay, let me switch camera real quick. Let me see. I have my camera on a little handheld stuff, so I just wanna make sure I can't see myself right now. Okay, let me stop share. Okay, so here is my Raspberry Pi. Okay, you see that? So you are to glue or stick the heat sink, which is the silver fins, okay? Or the metal fins on this one, that's the main processor, this one, which is for the RAM, 
So two gig that you that comes with this and then this one. Okay, there are three pieces. They need to go on your Raspberry Pi. Now, you notice that I put mine in the case. The easiest way to put it in this case is to take it the case apart first. The bottom piece comes off. So you can take off the bottom piece in the empty case, put the Raspberry Pi on the bottom piece first, and then put its wall on top of it. Okay, so the wall sit flush on it. Okay, then it has a top and you can leave it open while you work on it. And the top, you can put the fan on it. Normally, we don't really attach this unless we put the cover back on. For now, you don't need to attach the fan. But the fan, it's really straightforward. You give it, you connect black to the ground and red to the five volt or the three volt and it should run. I think fans only need 1.5 volts anyway. Even your computer fans, it's like 1.2, okay? So the fans just pop in, you don't need to screw it in or anything. So you can just have this ready in case you need to put the cover on and cool it. If you, if you turn it on later on, you're gonna see that it's gonna be very warm, okay? So you would see that it has, it needs to be cool. And so the heat sink is gonna cool it off. And then the fan is also gonna cool it off. So if you're buying a Raspberry Pi now, make sure that the case that you pick has a fan, okay? Especially if you're gonna use it for like retro game console or something like that. It's gonna be very hot. Okay, okay, so that's the first few steps. Put the heat sink and all that stuff on and then put your, you know, you can, you, you don't have to put your Raspberry Pi on the actual case right now. What I did was after I had uh, transferred the image to the micro SD, then I put it in the, the actual case because I want to make sure that, you know, I put everything in flush. And the case, it has the cutout. So when you put it in, make sure that you line up the cutout for your USB right? And then you see these cables there for my, my uh, keyboard and stuff, right? And then on the other side, I connected my micro HDMI and my power. And what you see is I worked on the project for tomorrow. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. Okay. Any question? Okay, so I'm gonna stop this camera and switch back. All right. Okay, of the two fins are attached, do we unstick them? Yes. So you just peel the blue paper from the back of it. They already put glue on it. And then you just, they are kind of um, sticky so if you put it in crooked, you have to adjust it right away because they will dry up and be crooked. <laughs> so make sure that they sit, they sit like on top of correctly. Yeah, that's it. Alex has it. Yeah, so. Uh, so mine's are stuck, uh, stuck together. I've been trying oh, to- Oh, just pull them apart. Yeah, they, yeah, just pull them, pull the baby one on the top up and then you would be able to, to and then you can peel back the, the blue sticker and stick it on your. Thank you. Yeah. So will it matter if you don't use the heat sink? In the long run, it would. You can still run it without heat sink. Many people do. Uh, maybe because they don't have it with their kit. Not all kits come with heat sink, right? Um, but you want to use heat sink so that way it keeps it cool and it will last a long time. Your, comp your processor and your computer has that too. So. Um, they're like little fingers that's going to draw out the, I call them the fins, it draws out the, the heat from the processor. Okay, so that's the few things. So once you have put your, your USB, so I, we put everything on and then you are going to visit this website. 
okay? So I'm gonna click on it so you can see. Um, when you go to that website, what you're gonna do is you are going to download Raspberry Pi Imager. I don't know why my computer is misbehaving today with the touchpad. Okay, so depending on the operating system you're using on your computer, so if you use a Mac OS, then you need to download the imager for Mac OS. If you're using Chromebook, you need to use that. If you're using the, if you're using the Windows PC, there's one for Windows. So all you need to do is download it and then it will give you, you know, the, the installer package. In Windows PC, you would see an EXE. So I had downloaded already, so you can see. Um, here's that. It will say Imager 1.6.2, and then you just simply run it, okay? Um, and then just do the installation. So you just click install, next, next, and finish. Everything is default. So what that does is it gives you a way to write an image to your micro SD. So the files for operating system are normally, they can be raw files, so they need to be packaged as an image file, right? As a .iso. So in any operating system you install, it has to be in an image format. Um, most of the time we would see it as an ISO. So in order to do that, we would have to, to use a software tool to do that. Um, you know, there are other type of software, but they have created this. So, okay. And they also give you the instructions in a little bit of a video there. Okay, so if you have Windows, you download this one. If you have Mac OS, you download this one. If you're running Linux, you download this one, okay. And then after you finish the installation, it's going to look like their screenshot right here. This is taken from an Apple, you can tell. Um, okay. So I'm going to open the application so you can see what it looks like. Okay, it will look like this. Okay, so make sure that you have your USB with the micro SD inserted into your USB slot on your computer. You can use 2.0, 3.0. These things are usually 2.0 anyway. Okay. Um, and then after that, I have a chat question, so let me check it. Okay. Nope, that was just a delay notification from. Zoom. So after you have installed the Pi Imager, you're going to do choose. Okay. And so the, the recommended version of this is going to be the Pi OS 32 bit, which already comes with your, with your SD. Okay. When you buy Canakit, they already have it installed for you. But I want you to use a fuller version so you know what some of the applications and the feature would be because the, the version is going to give you, you know, some applications while the other doesn't. Okay. If you're doing the light, you're going to see that it's going to be stripped down and it's going to be minimal. Okay. So here you can see all the other ones here. Okay. So. If you want all the other ones, you can check out the other ones, but we're gonna do other and we are gonna do the full. Okay, so once you have your imager install, open it or run it, it's gonna ask you to run it anyway at the end, right? You can click yes. And then you're gonna choose OS first. You're gonna go to Raspberry Pi OS other, and then you are going to select the full, which is the second one. So this is the buster, uh, yeah. So this is the full version. Now, you notice that the light had no desktop. So you have to use everything in the terminal. 
So if you wanted to get good at commands and not click buttons and stuff like that, use you can use the light, but there's no graphical user interface, okay? When I first learned Linux, I didn't have a choice. Linux didn't come with graphical user interface back then, like Red Hat wasn't. So um, I, I had to use everything in terminal and that's how I learned Linux. So it's a good practice for those of you who really want to learn Linux. Um, and then, so we're going to use this one with the desktop so it's easy in case you need to troubleshoot, okay? So once you pick this, then you are going to choose your storage. And then all you have to do is you are going to browse to your USB. I didn't connect mine because I already used my USB for other things right now, <laughs> sorry. Um, but you will be able to see like the, the, the micro SD and then all you have to do is point to it and it's going to it's going to ask you to format it's just say yes because you're going to wipe everything on there and then put everything so this process is going to to image it is going to be about 10 15 minutes and i'm going to run over a little bit but we got to make up for the monday um, but if you need to go i understand you can type your name and then you can sign off okay so uh, i have about yeah it's yes. done it's the mass storage one, right? <laughs> yes, it yeah. says mass storage. Uh -huh. Perfect. It would say mass storage. Mm -hmm. And then if it asks you to format, that means that it wants to, you know, reformat, wipe everything, and then write over it, that's fine. Um, we're not keeping the recommended version that they gave us because it's a little dated. You, you're going to see that even if we install this one, we're still going to have to update it and upgrade it. Yeah, constantly. Okay, so choose your mass storage and then just let it go. It's gonna verify, it's gonna do its thing. It's gonna show you the status bar um, after it asks you if you wanted to format it and that this process took 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Any question with this? Okay, so Albert asked me a question earlier since we're gonna be getting into the area that it's gonna require V and C or if you're using, if you have, so I recommend using a keyboard, a mouse and a monitor, but if you don't have one, that's okay. You can use your laptop only if your laptop is capable of using V and C, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, then, so after you choose your storage, your mass storage device from USB, you're gonna click right, you're gonna let it go, you're gonna wait about 10, 15 minutes, then you need to connect your Raspberry Pi, okay? So here, if you have a mouse and a keyboard and a monitor, so if, you, if you're using like a desktop computer, you can, you can replace your desktop computer with the Raspberry Pi for now, okay? But if you don't have that, if you only have a laptop to go to school, then you would use VNC. And I recommend using real VNC. So there's a link right here that shows you how to do that. Okay. It talks about how you can connect to how you can install it. Okay. But the challenge would be that you have to see it in order to install this on the actual Raspberry Pi. Right. But there is a tutorial video that I put here. Uh, I'm sorry, here. Okay, it's a YouTube video that somebody created and I watched it and it's valid, it's good. So she walks you through on how to use it, how to use VNC, how to enable it and how to connect to it. Okay, so watch the video. Okay. That's why you should oh. never throw away old mouse and keyboard. Yes, Cynthia. Oh, sorry, I, I was wondering um, because I have a laptop, but I have an extra monitor. But because I have a laptop, I have to use real VNC. Uh, yeah, if you don't have an extra mouse and keyboard, you will have to use that. Oh, well, yeah. So, have, um... yeah. so if you have a mouse, a keyboard and uh, like a TV, you can plug this into your TV. Okay, you know, yeah. Okay. That will work too. 
if we have them like for Bluetooth um, keyboard and Bluetooth mouse, does that also that's, work? Yeah, that's fine. You just have to you just have to sync them. Pair them. Yeah. So when you most mouse and keyboard that are Bluetooth or, or wireless, they have a little USB adapter. Plug that USB adapter to the Raspberry Pi, right? And then turn on your mouse and keyboard when you connect it. It takes a second for it to configure, but you just gotta pair it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch screen share real quick so I'm, I can show you how to configure that. Okay, one second. Let me stop share on this one. I'm on my laptop for regular lecture, and then my Raspberry Pi and stuff is hooked up next to me, so I can I can swap. Okay, let's share screen. Okay, so um, most of the configuration that you do is going to be in preferences, but the communication stuff is here, right? Like your, your sound is here. I have mine on mute because it will be echo if I'm on Zoom next to one system to another. And then this is your wireless. Okay, so if you want to connect it, you can configure it here. I think I wrote the instruction for you to do that also. You can do it in terminal or you can do it here. Okay, so um, your Bluetooth, if it's if it's using Bluetooth, it would show like a little Bluetooth thing here. But like I said, it, and anytime that you need to change system settings, you would go to the Raspberry bu button at the top and then the preferences. Okay, so after it goes through and you know, um, after you finish with the image on the USB, take it out, take your micro SD out, and then you're going to plug it into your, your Raspberry Pi. It's the slot that's opposite from, it's at the other end from your USB. Okay, so if your USB is on one end, look at the other end of the Raspberry Pi, right, and there's a little slot. So when you stick in the micro SD, right, the right, the pin needs to touch the gold pin. So you see like the, the, the gold pins for the micro SD, so flip your micro SD upside down where the pin is facing the top and you're gonna insert it, okay? Once you plug it in, then you will plug in your mouse, your keyboard, your monitor, or if you're using the, um, if you're using the um, VNC, you would then need to connect it, okay? So it's gonna go and do its thing for the installation. It's gonna take like a few more minutes and then it's going to boot to the desktop. Okay, so let me close. Oh, I can't close that because if I do, then I will be out of the share advertising. All right, so the terminal, when I say terminal in the assignment, it's this thing right here. So you can click on it to open terminal. So I have my terminal running like right here, okay. And then if you need to use your web browser, this is use Chromium. It looks like the Chrome, okay? And then your file manager is here, okay? And then anytime that you want to run other applications, it's categorized. So anything for programming, like for little kids, they use Scratch, Scratch and Scratch 3. Okay, you there's I, I install Python three, so you see that there. Uh, Wolfram is really good to use for math classes, um, and then for Tani, um, I use Tani also for product programming, and you also have Genie. So there are a couple of the IDE, and then there's also BlueJ Java. So if you use the um, if you're using the um, the full version, you're gonna have more applications compared to the standard recommend version. We are gonna do Sonic Pi in Raspberry Pi. And on this one, I think it's gonna be great because it has more RAM and it's not gonna be laggy. Okay, any question? Okay, so Raspberry Pi comes was developed in the UK 
So you might run into issues with the keyboard is default to the UK. So when you program and when you're trying to use symbols like, you know, semicolon, colon, quotation marks, UK keyboard is a little bit different. When you type that button, you press on that button, it gives you something else. So it's important that you configure the keyboard to be English US. So I had also written down the step for you to do that in the instructions after you finish the installation. Okay. Any question? So at the beginning, when you boot your desktop, it's going to prompt you to configure anyway. So if you if you see it there, you can just start it there and then just take a picture for me when you submit. Okay. Or you can follow the steps and you can do it in terminal or using preferences. Okay. So your sound and video is here and then your graphic is here. Okay, let me Okay, I'm going to show you how you can update. So anytime that you need to install any applications or, or, or packages. So when I say packages, that could be for scripting purposes, like libraries that you would need um, for GPIO and things like that. And you see, I, I installed the GPIO. So what you need is you need to really um, make sure that it gets updated. Okay, and Raspberry Pi Debian versions, um, they use, so sudo stands for super user do, okay, and then for app get update. So when you do app get update, it only going to pull, it's kind of like downloading the update, okay, and then you still, you know, so when I press like this, right, what it's going to do is it's going to go through, see how it's a, a buster version and it's going to check its version. So if everything is already updated, then it's going to finish very quick. But if, if you see a bunch of things and it's going to ask you, yes, you want to write that into the storage, then you're going to have to let it go and, and you have to update. So a good practice is to always update it every now and then. <coughs> and then also, if you wanted to upgrade it to the later releases, um, you can also do an, an upgrade, okay? And so you can do super, super user do sudo, sudo apt upgrade, okay? So what does this do for us? It's gonna pull all the things that's gonna be up, up more of an updated version for your OS. <coughs> and that's including firmware. Okay, so that's kind of like what we normally would have to do first. I already did it earlier. So this process alone sometimes takes a few minutes. Okay, <coughs> sorry. So once you do the update, take this picture on your phone or your webcam, you're gonna submit that. <coughs> and then you are going to go into preferences and you are going to go to Raspberry Pi configuration. So I'm showing you to do two ways. This first, you're going to do the graphical user interface where you're going to click. Then the second step, it's going to show you how to do later on. You're going to see it, how to do it in using, using the terminal. So localization <laughs> Let us set up the locale, which is going to be the region. And it's important for software so that way we can have the proper keyboard and instructions and languages that we need and time. So for the locale, just make sure that it's English and US, okay, because it will default to the UK. And then for the time zone, Okay, 
just uh, make sure that it's Los Angeles. That's the closest city to us. So it's the same time zone. Okay. And then for the keyboard, you got to make sure that it's English US. Okay. So check those things because if you don't, you're gonna run into problem down the line when you start programming tomorrow. Because it's gonna, you, when you type something and it comes out something else, then you have to check your keyboard, okay? All right. Then in step 29, I show you how you can use your terminal to do that. And whatever you can do in a graphical user interface, you can do in terminal. Okay, so when you do sudo raspi, right, config, it's exactly like clicking here, here, and, and here. Okay, so you can type one line and do that or click three things. Okay, so this is, so what you see here is a graphical user interface. What you see in here is a UI, okay? It's the user interface. Now in this one, if you're familiar with form, you know, building your computer and accessing BIOS, it's limited in that you cannot use your mouse. You can only use your keyboard and the up and down arrow key and the enter key, okay? So in the system options, you can configure your wireless LAN, you, you can add in your SSID and your passphrase. You can also reset your password. You can do everything that you can do by clicking. All you have to do is just move up and down. And then if I need to get back to where I was earlier, use the right and left arrow, okay? The right arrow would bring you to the select and Mac. So in step 29 and 30, it shows you how to go into system options, which is the first one. And then you are gonna configure wireless LAN. So when you press enter here, it simply just have you enter your SSID and then you know, you're gonna move to the okay by using the arrow key. And then it's gonna ask you for the passphrase and you can just type it in. So all you have to do is put in your wireless router at home information, and then that's how you're gonna be able to connect, okay? So I'm gonna cancel that. And then when you finish, okay, you just go down and you would go finish, and then it takes you back to the terminal. All right, another thing that you're gonna be doing, I'm about to finish and then we'll pick up from here by tomorrow. And I'm gonna be available for office hours after this. So after we update and everything, if you already run updates, you don't have to do it multiple times, right? I only write it just in case you didn't forget it. Um, you are gonna do sudo apt, okay? Install, okay? Python 3, idle 3. Now this steps right, the, the step 36 actually talks about uh, updating PIP. The only reason why I added it there is sometime you might use PIP to install things for Python. And it's always good to make sure that Python 3 PIP is used. So that's why I wrote step 36. Then step 37 allows you to install Python and if it's already there, it's gonna tell you it's there. And you can always check the version. See how I go back to the last command by using the up arrow key? Okay. So you can go to Python dash dash versions and it tells you native is 2.7. We also installed 3. Point something on there. And then you can program directly by calling Python. Okay. Like I can say print, put it in a string. Hello, friends. Oops. 
and it prints. And then when you want to get out of shell, you just do an exit function with the parentheses and it brings you back to terminal. You can also use nano to program it. It's, there's so many things you can do with Linux. It's beautiful where it's seamless, right? Like clicking five application is not seamless, okay? All right, I'll pick it up from here tomorrow. Um, you know, your goal is to finish installing and if you can go through some of the later steps, okay? And then all, I, all we need to do is finish part A, B, and C for this week. So we should have a lot of time still for the next, the next, and for today and tomorrow. Okay, any questions? Uh, Dr. All right, so please. Questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering, is your office hours right after class or is it? A, yeah, I'm going to sign. I'm going to go to the other Zoom link right after this. So if you need okay. help, you can you can stop by there. And then if you have issues with BMC or something, let me know. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, everybody, type your name into the chat if you haven't. Thank you so much. See you manana. Bye. Bye. Bye.